I'll introduce briefly our main speaker today, more in the morning, Professor Kathleen Balog from Rutgers University. She'll give a talk on physicalism, anti-physicalism, and metaphysical gridlock. This talk will be commented by Claudia Passos. Okay, we present her comments. Okay, Claudia Passos would like to stay there only to see better what Kathleen Balog will say. Okay, I thank you very much. Stage. Thank you so much, Wilson. And thanks so much for the organizers, Rodrigo and Marco and Gustavo for organizing this conference and for the incredible hospitality, um, indulging us all, it's really wonderful. And uh, my history with coming with Brazil is, is uh, uh, like berries, because we were planning to come together <laughs> 2013 to that wonderful conference on phenomenal concepts. Um, which was interrupted for us by Barry's stint in the hospital. And boy, I am glad that we are here now and <laughs> alive and kicking. And, uh, and so uh, I am, uh, my talk is going to be on a long standing debate discussion um, with David about the conceivability arguments against physicalism. And, uh, and uh, so David uh, um, formulated and presented the, you know, a version of these arguments in an incredibly um, sophisticated uh, form in his, his books and papers. So first in, in the 1996 book and, and then, then a definitive version in the paper in, in 2009, the two-dimensional argument against materialism. Um, so I've been uh, um, uh, interested in these, these arguments from the physicalist point of view. And my teacher, my, uh, my, uh, uh, my advisor at Rutgers was Brian Lohr, who, who came up with uh, what I think is an incredibly, in, incredibly powerful reply to the conceivability argument and, and uh, oh my god that paper was written in 1990 so 30 years ago <laughs> um, by by lore and and what i've been trying to do is is to develop that that idea to to give answers to both dave's version of the conceivability arguments and and other versions as well such as the knowledge argument uh, the explanatory gap argument, property dualism argument, and, and so on, grasping phenomenal concepts argument by Martina Nidarumelin. So, uh, so I, I developed some replies originally, uh, a zombie refutation, you know, which is based on the idea that zombies too would give these conceivability arguments, but their conclusion would be false. Try, I was trying to refute these arguments that way. And then a kind of, kind of stronger, more general strategy you know, that is dubbed the phenomenal concept strategy that, that I've been you know, working on and, and uh, as, as a response to the arguments and as a defense of materialism. So, so as the debate was, has been going on for many years, I've became puzzled of uh, how come that the anti-physicalists don't understand and accept my, my completely devastating refu <laughs> refutations of their arguments. Why are they not just, you know, cry uncle and... <laughs> Thank you, so can we go home? <laughs> And th then I figured probably they are quite as puzzled, you know, why I insist on this, you know, flawed strategy of, <laughs> of trying to refute the arguments. They already explained why it's flawed and so on and so forth. Um, it seems intractable. And after a while, I, um, I got more puzzled by the, um, by the meta puzzle of why this is such an intractable 
discussion than, than by the puzzle of consciousness itself. Uh, do you hear me? Is the, is the mic working? Yeah. Um, and so, so in this paper I'm trying to provide a novel resolution that is sort of dissolving this meta problem, you know, the, the intractability of, of this, the, the apparent intractability of this debate. So, and, and I will, I will, um, I, I keep to, ah. <laughs> Um, and so I will keep uh, uh, until a little bit later, uh, you know, telling you what this uh, proposal, you know, resolution of, of the dialectic is. Um, so here is the plan of the paper. So I first, uh, like in a very quick way, go through the zombie argument and the physicalist responses to, uh, uh, to the zombie argument. So, so start with a little background to the argument. The, the zombie argument. So um, let's talk about the two ontologies at, at play in this argument. So uh, physicalism uh, says that the world's fundamental ontology is physical, and so the fundamental entities and properties and laws are all physical, and roughly that means that fundamental physical properties and entities are non-mental and don't have mental aspects. Uh, and all phenomena, including mental phenomena, are grounded in some complex um, arrangement of physical properties. Okay, so then obviously anti-physicalism is the denial of this, so according to anti-physicalism, the fundamental ontology includes more than just the physical. Okay? It includes fundamental non-physical entities and or properties, and uh, so, so what are the usual, what, what are the, the var varieties of anti-physicalism? So the usual suspects are idealism, substance dualism in their interactive and non-interactive forms, panpsychism, and property dualism also in its interactive and non-interactive forms. Okay, for, for this talk I am not going to talk about idealism, substance dualism, or panpsychism pan for various reasons. I find uh, substance dualism um, very implausible, uh, positing the existence of entities we really don't have any reason to posit. Panpsychism I find a very interesting view, but, but at this point incomplete in that the combination problem needs to be resolved in some way. So I'm going to focus in this talk only on property dualism and within that on the topic will be non-interactive property dualism with regard to its relationship to physicalism. So although I find interactive property dualism a very interesting view and it seems to be maybe the most promising version of anti-physicalism but since today there hasn't been any empirical corroboration of that, I'm going to um, put that to the side right now also. So, uh, so, so the two views at play uh, at the moment uh, in this paper is physicalism and non-interactive property dualism that I will call NIP dualism for short. So it's physicalism and NIP dualism. So just a quick uh, like um, primer again on what, uh, uh, what these two views say about the relationship of the physical and the mental. So in physicalism, um, the relationship between Q being a, a phenomenal property, P physical property and F functional property. So the idea is the two main views that physicalists have about the relationship between phenomenal and physical properties is either property identity, so any um, phenomenal property Q is identical to some physical property P, or that phenomenal properties are functional but realized by physical properties. So these are the two versions of, um, of physicalism. And physicalism also um, assumes the closer causal closure of physics. 
causal closure of physics being the doctrine that every physical event has uh, a, a complete explanation, as complete as possible in, in physical uh, terms. Okay, so let's look at non-interactive property dualism. So here the relationship between um, phenomenal and physical functional properties is, is different, although the view is, is in, in many ways symmetrical or uh, correlated with, with physicalism. So, the, so one of the ideas is that phenomenal properties are connected by fundamental vertical laws to, um, to physical um, okay, so, so that they are um, connected by fundamental physical law either to a physical property or to a functional property. Okay, and also non-interactive property dualism, you know, since it's non-interactive, um, assumes the causal closure of physics as well. So these are the two views you know, at play. Okay, what's the conceivability argument? So as conceivability arguments start with a claim about some sort of gap between either conceptual or epistemic or explanatory gap between phenomenal descriptions of the world and physical descriptions of the world and conclude from that that there is an ontological gap between the physical and the phenomenal. So the, one of the well-known forms is the zombie argument. So the zombie arguments start with the claim that zombies are conceivable and it concludes that zombies are possible and so physicalism is false. So uh, starts with a claim about a, a, a conceptual gap and argues to a metaphysical and ontological gap between the physical and the phenomenal. So this argument hangs on a crucial premise con connecting conceivability and possibility. Okay, so uh, before I start spelling out the argument in a little more um, precise form, a little primer on what physicalism requires. So physicalism is not defined in the following way that I'm going to present, but it requires, so it's a necessary condition on physicalism being true. And that's that for all true positive statements, T, it's necessary that if P, then T, uh, and here P is the complete fundamental physical description of the world, including the fundamental laws as well. So, so this is a necessary condition for physicalism to be true. So the zombie argument starts, um, starts uh, with the premise that um, Q is a phenomenal truth, so there are some phenomenal truths in the world um, then the, you know, the, the second premise is this physicalist entailment thesis, so if physicalism is true, then um, the application of the entailment thesis for, for Q, for this phenomenal truth in the world, so it says if physicalism is true, then it's necessary that if P, then Q. Uh, the third thesis is the zombie conceivability thesis that P uh, and the denial of Q, this phenomenal truth, is conceivable. So if zombies are conceivable, then P and not Q is conceivable. And, uh, and the fourth premise is that if P and Q is conceivable, then P and Q is metaphysically possible. So this is the crucial premise. It's the kicker in the argument. Um, it is the one that bridges conceivability with metaphysical possibility, I'll call it the CP principle. So if P and not Q is metaphysically possible, then physicalism is false. Well, it follows from the, uh, from the physicalist entailment thesis. Um, if P and Q is metaphysically possible, then it cannot be true that uh, necessarily if P then Q, and so the conclusion is that physicalism is false. So that's a simple version of the argument. So, so what about the, the physicalist rebuttal? So the physicalist rebuttal um, the, uh, that, that I'm most 
interested in appeals to the phenomenal concept strategy. So the core idea there is that one can explain the, what, what Dave called yesterday or, or the day before, what Dave called the problem intuitions. Um, the, you know, the, the problem intuition is that these gaps, the explanatory, conceptual, um, epistemic gaps between physical, functional, physical and, and phenomenal um, um, uh, descriptions is somehow problematic. So, the, so these are the problem intuitions. And so the phenomenal concept strategy comes up with a way of diffusing the problem intuition. So the, the core idea is that these problem intuitions arise because of some peculiarity in, our, uh, in the way that we form phenomenal concepts, some peculiarity in the cognitive makeup of phenomenal concepts, and not some peculiarity, some ontological peculiarity about um, phenomenal states themselves. Okay, so, so, um, so a quick account of phenomenal concepts here. So the first thing to observe about phenomenal concepts is that we have uh, in introspection, so you, uh, you turn your attention to some phenomenal experience that you're having right now and in that act of attending to it, you are able to form a phenomenal conception of that phenomenal experience. So, so take some colored experience or um, whatnot. Take a colored experience you know, as a, a part of your visual experience right now. Focus your attention to it. You are able to form a conception of that experience by this act of attending to it and, and then form a thought about that. So these are the, the kind of introspective concepts of experience that the phenomenal concept strategy is um, exploiting or, 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 or um, appealing to in its account. So you form these um, concepts, phenomenal concepts in introspection and these concepts have some interesting cognitive features. Um, one is that they are direct concepts and the other that they are substantial um, in, in an interesting way, that they're, they give a substantial grasp on their referent. So what I mean by direct is that they um, do not pick out their referent via physical, functional, structural, whatever descriptions but they pick out the reference directly. So if we go back to that act of introspectively forming a phenomenal concept, you just attend by attending to it, the simple act of attention forms that concept directly without any further cognitive apparatus. And these concepts are also substantial in that we know exactly what we are talking about when we are, when we are thinking about these phenomenal states because they are right there in, uh, in our awareness, seemingly in, uh, in a way that we are completely aware what they are, you know, completely aware of, of the nature of their referent. So we have an impressively vivid mode of presentation of the referent that seems to reveal the very essence of that referent uh, when we think about our experience in this way. So, so here's a little bit more theoretical way of putting it. So, so uh, the version that I favor is the constitutional account of phenomenal concepts. And so such concepts, phenomenal concepts, as I said, have no descriptive mode of presentation like uh, arguably most other concepts have, but rather they pick out, you know, concept tokens pick out their reference in virtue of their being partly constituted by tokens of that um, experience um, whose phenomenal, phenomenal feature is the referent of the concept. 
So here is a, a, so a, a little bit more. Oh, okay, so, so, so what, what I mean by constitution, you know, constitutive account of phenomenal concept, I mean that literally the phenomenal concept that we form in this act of introspection contains the experience as a part of the concept. And here is a little bit more visual way of, uh, of, of explaining that. So, so, so the, this, this pinkish square will stand for the experience of a pink color. So that's the experience with, with a certain phenomenal character. And this account says that there is a mental um, mechanism that is analogous to linguistic quotation in that it takes an expression, in, in, in this way a, a, a phenomenal representation, and turns it into a representation of itself, of, of, the, of, of the, a representation of the representation. So I, I mark that with those little um, stars here. That, the, that little star, star um, stands for the mental mechanism that turns that experience into a concept of the experience. So that's the, that's the concept of, um, oops, where are we, yeah, concept of phenomenal red. Okay, so what's the upshot, upshot of this? So the upshot of this, the, the significance of this strategy is that, um, that it explains, this account of phenomenal concept explains and here is the really important part. It, it explains in a way that's consistent, perfectly consistent with physicalism. It explains the problem intuitions, why we don't get perspicuous explanations of phenomenal experience in physical or biological or functional terms, why zombies are conceivable, why Mary seems to have learned a new fact, you know, when she gets out of the black and white room and so on. Okay, so, so let me just say a little bit more about it in the case of zombie conceivability. So zombies are conceivable because phenomenal concepts are conceptually independent of any physical concepts. If the phenomenal, this account of constitutional account of phenomenal concept is right, then then uh, phenomenal concepts are conceptually independent of physical concepts, and then of course we can conceive of zombies. Because there will be nothing in the, you know, in the, in the physical conception of a human being that will conceptually mandate uh, the, the appearance of phenomenal experience. So the other thing to observe, observe is that this explanation is independent of whether we assume physicalism or dualism. And so, to emphasize again, it is compatible with physicalism. And so, so what the phenomenal concept strategy achieves here is renders those problem intuitions um, innocuous, renders them powerless to support the CP principle, the principle connecting conceivability with possibilities. It kind of takes the wind out of the sail. You know, that's um, you know, how I would think about it. Okay, so first we uh, surveyed the conceivability, the zombie argument, then we surveyed how the physicalist sort of takes this challenge, you know, answers this challenge. So where does this dialectic stand? So, of course, the phenomenal concept strategy is not a knockdown rebuttal. Um, rational people can perfectly well stick to their guns, you know, stick to the zombie argument, stick to the CP principle, and complain that the phenomenal strat concept strategy itself is illegitimate because it ignores the that the CP principle 
um, renders both physical phenomenal identities and also physical theories of phenomenal concept illegitimate. Okay? So that's exactly how they've argued in um, the paper Phenomenal Concepts and the Explanatory Gap, right? No? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So, so a lot more things. I just wanted to know if that's the paper. We're <laughs> okay. Um, okay, but, but here is the other side. At the same time, the physicalists can also resist at this point, the conceivability arguments, having undermined the intuitions behind the CP principle. And so the physicalists can also very rationally hold on to this account. So basically what's happening, both camps, if they uh, assume their most uh, fundamental, um, you know, if, if they take uh, an assumption about the relationship between conceivability and possibility, you know, each one a different one. If they take that principle, they can, with that principle, you know, armed with that principle, can defend themselves against any attack from the other side, show that their theory is coherent and so on, but both sides can do that. Okay, so now we are on the second part, gridlock. So, so I would like to argue that there really is a gridlock here, that there really is a at least there is an apparent irresolvability of this, uh, of this debate. So, so what I'm proposing is that there is no rationally compelling reason why one way or another, either empirical reason or a priori reason one way or another. Um, that would favor one side over the other. Okay, so, so first, empirical resolution. So, uh, so remember that we are talking about physicalism and NIP dualism, non-interactive property, property dualism, both of which um, assume the causal closure of, of physics. So if the physical is causally closed, then if either framework can accommodate all empirical fa facts, then the other will be able to accommodate is just as well. Um, and that's because, um, because non-mental properties, if the physical is causally closed, cannot have any independent effects from the physical. So, so any, um, any empirical facts that uh, are accommodated by one view will be accommodated by the other view as well. Okay. Um, of course, the constitutional account of phenomenal concepts needs corroboration in cognitive neuroscience, but at this point, there is, re there is really no reason for a major doubt that this could be done. So, so how about a priori resolution? So as I said, you know, just recap again, as I said, uh, both sides, both the physicalist and the nip dualist side can just stick to their guns and be perfectly happy in rebutting the other side, you know, given their favorite assumptions. So if you start with the CP principle, you can explain why physicalism is false. You can also explain why the phenomenal concept strategy cannot get off the ground. Um, one of the reasons given is that phenomenal concepts cannot be purely physical, just like phenomenal states can't, because of the CP, princi uh, CP principle showed that, shown by the CP principle. So the green guys are here, the, the dualists, the, the, the blue guys are the physicalists. So the physicalists, if you start with the phenomenal concept strategy, and the suspension of the CP principle, you can explain how the problem intuitions supporting the CP principle are compatible with physicalism, and so you can undercut the CP principle. It's true you assume the falsity of the CP principle, but it's not really begging the question one way or another, because on that assumption you, you can actually show that there is no reason to hold uh, no independent reason to hold the CP principle. 
So that removes the main reason against physicalism. So, so it looks like from that point of view, there is no a priori resolution. I also can't see any sort of metaphysical principle external to those two systems, you know, physicalism and nip dualism, that could somehow be the arbiter. And I also um, don't see that there are holistic considerations that greatly favor one side or the other. So each side has its problems. Dualism uh, suffers from the uh, from the epi epiphenomenalism um, uh, issue, uh, epiphenomenalism or causal overdetermination problem. Um, well, physicalism, who knows? It sounds a little implausible, so <laughs> so that might count against it. But but there are all these holistic considerations. It doesn't look like there is a real resolution on those grounds. It looks like physicalism and nip dualism are equally good or bad as general metaphysical frameworks. Of course, you know, this, um, this is a very big topic and there might come up some, um, some considerations that would, uh, that would be rationally compelling, but I assume for now that there are no such. Okay, so, so for a resolution, Hmm. Yeah, um, no, it's okay, sorry. So for the resolution, so, so physicalism and anti-physicalism, you know, just to recap what we have said so far, they make apparently conflicting and apparently irresolvable claims about the connections between conceivability and possibility, and also, of course, uh, conflicting claims about the, the fundamental nature of phenomenality. But despite the seeming, um, seeming irresolvability, it seems that this conflict involves a factual disagreement, and that's particularly annoying, um, uh, so to speak, how, how to say it. It's a particularly annoying that it looks like there is no possibility of any resolution, and yet it seems like a, you know, a, a, a robustly factual disagreement. So I will suggest a way out of this conflict that questions that second point, that questions the idea that there is a robustly factual disagreement going on. So now we are on the third part of the talk. Uh, which I call the dissolution of the mind-body problem, at least <laughs> with regard to physicalism and nip dualism. Okay, so, so what we have here, if, if I am right that there is really no compelling either empirical or, or a priori reason, one way or another in this debate, then it looks like we have a case of underdetermination of theory by evidence, so a scientific example of that is Bohmian versus Everett versions of quantum mechanics. A philosophical example would be perhaps tropes versus universals as fundamental. And the mathematical example uh, is Cantor's continuum hypothesis. And it looks like uh, the debate between nip dualism and physicalism is, is one as well. Okay, there are generally two responses to these cases. One is the realist response. There is a factual, so, so realists say about, for example, the quantum mechanics example, uh, that, there is, um, that there really is a factual debate between Bohm and Everett's version of quantum mechanics, even though there might be no way of finding out which state of affairs obtains, and it's natural to think that there's a factual debate between dualists and physicalists as well, you know, and including nip dualists and physicalists, even though there might be no way of finding out which state of, of affairs obtains. So the other, um, other position, you know, with regard to uh, such cases under determination of theory by evidence is anti-realism and the idea there would be that there's really no factual disagreement, that there's a terminological issue going on, 
that the apparent disagreement is merely a terminological variation in, in getting at the same underlying reality. So like the issue of whether today is twice as hot as yesterday might have uh, a, a, a yes answer in Fahrenheit scale and a no answer in Celsius scale. But there's n really no disagreement about the underlying facts about temperature. It's just that they're using different um, conceptual schemes to, uh, to represent the same reality. Um, so like perhaps the issue whether non-fundamental entities and properties exist might also be considered a terminological issue rather than an issue about the nature of the underlying reality. Um, and perhaps disagreements about whether someone is hairy or bold um, in borderline cases might be such, uh, such a disagreement that involves only terminological disagreement, but no disagreement about the underlying reality. So, so that's basically my proposal, that with regard to the physicalist and the, the debate between the physicalist and the NIP dualist, what we're having here is not a substantive factual disagreement, but a terminological one of a certain sort. So, so in all of the previous examples, so it differs from all of the previous examples, because our previous examples uh, involve um, a situation where is, the, where is the bedrock of fundamental or more fundamental facts, basic facts that, that the two sides of the debate can perfectly well agree on, right? Uh, but that's unlike the mind-body problem. It's not like the, the nip dualist and the physicalist can refer to some more basic realm of of, of facts um, which appeal to which would be, um, uh, you know, uh, appeal to which would resolve the debate, you know, so, so that both sides could agree on those most basic facts and only disagree on their particular way of describing them. It doesn't look that there is a more basic set of facts um, than the property um, and uh, an entity talk that, that physicalism and dualism is engaged in. So it's different from the previous cases. So what I propose is that, that yes, it's an, it's an interesting um, case of terminological disagreement where the concepts that are at issue in creating the terminological variants are our most fundamental ones. So this is a terminological issue that goes all the way down to the most basic description of reality. So, so that's the idea. And I, I'm now going to say a little bit more about what, what I think, you know, which concepts, um, co conceptual variants are at issue here creating the disagreement between nip dualism versus physicalism. So, how, how am I doing with time? <laughs> okay, great. Um, uh, so, so what I'm saying is that the relevant concepts of property, so it's the concept of property that sort of is at the heart of the disagreement. And that the relevant concept of property that figure in explicating the positions are different in a way that prevents the two, two positions to express a factual difference. And this difference is encoded in the CP principle, or rather the acceptance of the CP principle and the rejection of the CP principle. Um, and so, so a principle about concepts and properties, so I can sort of derive from the CP principle um, a more straightforwardly, a principle that more straightforwardly talks about the relationship between concepts and properties. 
So, so one might call it the conceptual transparency thesis, and it says that if C1 and C2 both refer rigidly to the same property P, then F, and it's not the case that C1 is identical with C2 is inconceivable. So C1 and C2 might be two rigid designators, one a physical concept is describing some brain state, and C2 might be a phenomenal concept, also rigid designator directly uh, um, denoting a phenomenal uh, property, okay? And so this principle says that, um, that involving such concepts, such rigid designators, um, for them to co-refer, it would be, um, uh, it would have to be the case that it's not conceivable that F and um, this identity fails. So, so yes, so, so F is the complete, yeah, F is the complete fundamental truth. Okay, so, um, so how does, how does that follow from the CP principle? So I'm going to kind of march through that very quickly. It, it follows pretty straightforwardly, but, and I'm going to go through that. If you don't quite get that part, don't worry about it because it's, you know, the rest of the argument is not, the, you know, uh, you, you'll still be able to follow the rest of the argument. So, so the version of the CP principle that figures in the zombie argument states that if P and not Q is conceivable, then P and not Q is metaphysically possible. So, so if you, so, so this, is a, this is derived from a, a more general formulation of the same principle, which is derived from an even more general, but we don't need to go there. Um, so the idea is that we, with regard to any fundamental truth F and any statement T in a world, um, it's, and, and let's uh, suppose that T is here an identity statement involving rigid designators. If, if F and not, and it's not the case that C1 is identical to C2, it's conceivable. Um, so if, if this is conceivable, F, and it's not the case that C1 is identical to C2, then it's metaphysically possible, right? So that's just the application of the CP principle, you know, a more general CP principle for this particular case involving rigid designators. Um, uh, and... Uh, uh, rigid designators. Okay. Um, on the other hand, because C1 and C2 are rigid designators, if the identity statement is true, it's necessarily true. So it's not possible that it is false. On the other hand, if F and it's not the case that C1 is identical to C2 is conceivable, then this... Oops. <laughs> um, then, then, then F, and it's not the case that C1 and C2 is, uh, C2 is possible, and so it's not the case that C1 and C2 is also possible, uh, which contradicts um, the, the, this, uh, you know, the original assumption. So by modus tollens, it follows. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, so by modus tollens, it follows. Where, where are we here? <laughs> um, it so okay. So, so by modus tollens, it it follows because um, because uh, of the. Of the you know of the application of CP principle says if this is conceivable then this is possible, um, 
uh, but if C1 and C2 is true, is necessarily true, so the possibility of F, and it's not the case that C1 is ident identical to C2, is incompatible with that. So by modus tollens, um, uh, we, we can conclude that, um, th that if C1 and C2 is true, then it's not conceivable that F and you know, the conjunction of F and the denial of the identity statement C is identical with, uh, with C2. Did that make sense? I think I garbled the, the, <laughs> the grammar here. <laughs> but so, so the idea is that from the CP principle, it follows for the particular case of identities involving rigid designators that it, it's not conceivable. Um, their denial concomitantly with the full fundamental description of the world is not conceivable. Because then it would be possible and that contradicts the, um, um, the, the, the idea that rigid designators um, flanking identity statements, if true, if, if the identity statement is true, it's necessarily true. Okay, so, so such a principle, the principle now being um, if, um, if C1, if C1 is identical to C2, it's not conceivable, you know, again, involving rigid desi designators. If C1 is identical to C2, it's not conceivable. Uh, it's failure together, conjoined with the full physical description, is not conceivable. That rules out, for example, phenomenal properties being identical with physical properties. But it doesn't uh, rule out, um, arguably doesn't rule out scientific identities like water is H2O because from there, from the full fundamental description, you can figure out that H2O is the, the substance that plays the water role and so on. So there, the identity statement is not um, the failure of it conjoined with the full physical description is not conceivable. So, so that's, um, that's the form of the principle that, um, the, the CP principle that most sort of straightforwardly and transparently um, encodes um, a thesis about the relationship between concepts and properties, okay? So, so that's the first um, sort of concept constituting principle for the dualist version of what properties are, the dualist conception of what properties are. And there is another uh, element of that dualist conception of what properties are. And, um, um, and that's that properties are not necessarily causally efficacious. So that's plausibly part of the um, of, of that conception of dualism that, um, that the non-interactive dualists are working with. Um, so they allow for properties are not causally efficacious to make room for epiphenomenalism uh, and so as to avoid you know, the massively implausible causal over determination view. So the second principle that um, that constitutes the dualist, the, the nib dualist um, uh, concept of, of property is that properties need not be causally efficacious. So here is um, the two, yeah. Number two? Ah, okay. So, so here are the two elements of it. So the, the first is, again, the transparency thesis that um, um, a property identity statements have to be, you know, involving rigid designators, have to be such that their denial is 
conjoined with the full physical description is inconceivable, and the second is that properties don't need to be causally efficacious. So that's the package deal that the, the dualist conception of properties is working with. So, so what is the physicalist package of, um, of, uh, of the concept of properties that they are working with? Well, so the physicalists reject the CP principle, and so they deny the transparency thesis. They say that distinct rigid designators, such as, for example, a physical concept C1 and a phenomenal concept C2, may still refer to a single property even though uh, it's conceivable, it's denial is conceivable, conjoined, it's denial conjoined with the full physical uh, um, uh, description of the world is conceivable. And the physicalist version of what properties are uh, actually stipulates that properties have to have some causal um, role in the world. So properties are causally efficacious. So, so these are the two different concepts I propose that underlie the metaphysical frameworks that the physicalist and the, um, and the dualist work with. Okay, um, so why are there these two different concepts? And of course that's also a very big um, question. I have some things to say about that, so, so it, it looks to me that our ordinary notion of property is pulled in different directions between these two, um, two sort of specifications. So it seems that uh, the, the transparency thesis has some intuitive pull, that there is this connection between properties and concepts such that there has to be, you know, th there has to be a certain amount of transparency in, in, our, um, in our way of uh, thinking about properties. And also the, the second element of the physicalist conception, the causal efficacy, is also, you know, has intuitive pull. So, so it seems like, you know, off the bat, you know, you know our con concept should be neither one and two, nor one prime and two prime, but a combination of one and two prime. Um, but there's a problem because given the completeness, physics, uh, completeness of physics, one and two prime leads to the conclusion either that there are no phenomenal properties, right? Because, um, because um, phenomenal properties can be physical, but yet they have to have uh, uh, causal, uh, causal roles, so one view is that there are no such then, or, or that they are causally over-determining their effects, and those are equally sad and wrong, seem, seemingly wrong views. And so, so we can't really just be happy with one and two prime, which would be the most natural way to think about it. And so the ordinary notion of property seems defective in these ways, is pulled in, in directions that, that don't capture um, you know, any reasonable <laughs> view, about, uh, view about properties um, in the world. And so, in the absence of a unified notion, it's, you know, we sort of go with, oscillate between these two um, packages, you know, one and you know, conjoined with two and one prime conjoined with two prime, we oscillate between the physicalist and dualist conceptions of property. So D properties satisfy one and two and P properties satisfy one prime and two prime and, and we sort of go you know, in, in different ways and you know, which concept of property we are talking about. So, so the way I see it, that the, the, the beauty of this proposal, this way of looking at it, is that both dualists and physicalists can be happy on this view. So there is, no, there is no reason to fight anymore about something that nobody can ever decide and so on. It's, it's like, oh, okay, so 
it's just, you know, we, we, we essentially agree on, um, you know, how, how the world is. So, so we are just, we, we, we both um, describe the world uh, how it is, we just use different conceptual variants in getting at the same reality. So that, that sort of could be a happy, um, happy conclusion or happy solution to this seemingly irresolvable, seemingly intractable, you know, gridlocked situation. So, so the idea is that if C1 is a phenomenal concept, it denotes a P property that's also denoted by a physical concept C2, and it also denotes a D property which is not denoted by any physical property, uh, sorry, by any physical concept at all. Um, so physicalism, so what follows is physicalism is true for uh, for P properties and dualism is true for D properties and vice versa. If, if physicalism is true for P properties, then dualism is true and vice versa. Now, of course, it's also possible that they're both false, right? So they, they sort of stand and fall together. So if one of them are true, the other is true. But if one of them are false, the other will be false as well. So, so for example, it turns out that 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 interactive dualism is true, then of course both of them, both physicalism and non-interactive dualism is false. So, actually I don't want to talk about whether it's plausible or not. <laughs> Let's go back. Uh, maybe, maybe we can, um, we can pick that, uh, take that up in the debate. So, so I, I think I'd rather end on this note that that really this view, in, in my opinion, um, proposes a, um, a nice resolution of, the, of, of this kind of, of this intractable debate that, that seems to have, um, you know, that, that, that embroils us in, in debating questions that we don't have the, the tools to resolve. So I think that that, that actually might even generalized to other philosophical problems where we have the same structure. You know, there is no resolution either empirically or a priori ways. You know, um, it might be that we don't have to continue debating, you know, the, the merits of, of, uh, of various views like um, what Betty was, was giving the example of whether fundamental properties are dispositional by nature. Um, or, or categorical by nature. So, so maybe there is other areas of philosophy where we have intractable debates where this resolution you know, gives a more um, satisfying, um, sa satisfying view of what's going on. So that's what I'd like to, to stop. Thank you. Uh, okay, so... Uh Thanks for the organizers, uh, Marco, Gustavo, and Rodrigo, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's my, I'm Brazilian, but it's my first time in Tiradentes. I've never been here before. It's a wonderful city. And also, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to comment on Balog's paper. It's a very it's a fascinating paper. And as Barry and Kochi said before, uh, they were supposed to come here for the conference I, uh, in 2013 on the phenomenal concepts. I was a student of Wilson at that time and was helping to organize. And uh, at that point, I was hoping to comment on, on Kochi's paper. So it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity now to comment <laughs> on her paper. It's a different paper, but it's, it's a great pleasure. Uh, and it's a great pleasure also to be here in a conference, in a workshop on Dave's work. It's really um, a wonderful opportunity. Okay, so... Uh, so start to... Uh, presenting very briefly the dialectic of the paper, and I will uh, 
focus my uh, my, my comment will be focused in the uh, uh, in what caught caught um, said much much more in the end the idea of that there is some uh, indeterminacy um, between dualism and uh, materialism. So in this paper, Balog addresses the impasse between materialism and dualism and offers a way to reconcile both positions. Her, con her conciliation is uh, the idea that it's indeterminate whether materialism or dualism is true. So, uh, as she presented, uh, she presented two arguments. One argument, uh, 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 the anti-physicalist argument against materialism, and she presented what she call, called uh, the physicalist rebuttal of the argument. So, I'll present briefly uh, these, uh, these two arguments just to... Um, to remind the dialectic of the paper. So the zombie argument goes like this. Zombies, physical duplicates without consciousness, are conceivable. If zombies are conceivable, zombies are possible. If zombies are possible, materialism is false. Conclusion, materialism is false. So the physicalist rebuttal of this argument is uh, what we can call the Illuminati argument. Uh, so the Illuminati is the idea that there are purely physical duplicates without consciousness. So, sorry? With consciousness, sorry, sorry. With consciousness. Uh, so the argument goes like it is. First premise, Illuminati are conceivable. If Illuminati are conceivable, Illuminati are possible. If Illuminati are possible, materialism is true. Conclusion, materialism is true. So here is the zombie versus the Illuminati. <laughs> so, uh, so Cotty goes in the dialectic of the paper, trying to show that both arguments work, and <laughs> try to show how can we uh, solve this or try to reconcile this, uh, this problem. So she shows that there is a sort of a puzzling symmetry between both arguments, the argument against physicalism, the conceivability of zombies, and the argument against dualism, the conceivability of Illuminati. Uh, there is this puzzling symmetry, and there is uh, no way to uh, to uh, solve this impasse between dualism and materialism. What? The, mic the microphone? Yeah. Is better like this? Yeah. OK. Uh, so there is no way to uh, solve this impasse, just uh, trying to, uh, to look for the arguments. So as Kotya also mentioned, she has been in this dialogue for many years with the dualist, Dave Chalmers, and, and trying to, uh, to uh, convince him that <laughs> her argument uh, against uh, dualism is, uh, is a better view. And uh, so now let's see how she can, what is her solution for, or her proposal for to solve this uh, problem between dualists and uh, physicalists. So what she offers as a solution is a sort of reconciliation uh, between materialism and dualism. What she says is that it's undetermined whether zombies are metaphysically possible. So this is the indeterminacy thesis. There is no determinate answer to whether consciousness is physical or non-physical. And uh, from now on, I focus my comment in, this, uh, in the, the determinist thesis and the consequence uh, if we assume the indeterminist thesis. So there are a variety of indeterminacy. Uh, I argue that Balog's indeterminacy re regarding the possibility of zombies leads to many other sorts of indeterminacy. And 
I will try to show, I try to go through these varieties of cases and see if Cot is, uh, uh, is happy to assume all the consequence of this uh, thesis. So, okay, so first, uh, it's important to distinguish between possible and actual. Uh, so, Balog claim that is indeterminate whether zombies are metaphysically possible. Well, the first question is, does this indeterminacy just concern what is possible, or is there also indeterminacy in the actual world? So this is first consideration. So at least there is one indeterminacy that the, the one, uh, one way that the indeterminacy thesis leads to uh, affect something in the, in the actual world. So Balog's indeterminacy at least affects metaphysical thesis about the actual world, for instance, materialism. If it's indeterminate whether zombies are possible, it's indeterminate whether materialism is true in the actual world. And we can see what else does the indeterminate thesis affect, if it affects other things in the, in the actual world. So indeterminacy of identity. Okay. No? Okay, so if consciousness is identical to a physical property, for instance, physical property N, uh, for instance, a neurostate, zombies are impossible. And maybe vice versa, I don't know. So if it is indeterminate whether zombies are possible, it may also be indeterminate whether consciousness is identical to a physical property N. So it is, if it is indeterminate, so if it, it is indeterminate, uh, if you consider that it's indeterminate whether zombies are possible, and it may also be indeterminate whether consciousness is identical to a physical property. So it is indeterminate what properties are identical to consciousness. So this identity, consciousness identical to a physical property, it seems to be indeterminate. So you cannot know which property is identical to consciousness, at least if you assume the indeterminacy thesis. Another uh, case for the indeterminate thesis is the indeterminate of causation. So if zombies are impossible, consciousness causes behavior. If zombies are possible, consciousness does not cause behavior. So if it is indeterminate whether zombies are possible, it is indeterminate whether consciousness causes behavior. And equivalently, it is indeterminate whether epiphenomenalism is true. So this is another consequence of the indeterminate thesis. Uh, another case is the indeterminate of distribution. So the question of the, the distribution question is uh, if it is is it also indeterminate which systems are conscious? So is the distribution of consciousness indeterminate? The distribution problem is, uh, is, is the question of which systems are conscious. So how, uh, how consciousness is distributed among different systems? So we can ask, if machines are conscious, if patients in vegetative states are conscious, if animals are conscious, if infants are conscious. So the distribution question uh, asks about does this, how consciousness is distributed among uh, different creatures. I will focus in the case I'm most interested in, that is the, uh, the infant case. So infant consciousness, so you can ask if there is some indeterminacy uh, about infant consciousness. So the indeterminacy of infant consciousness. 
So the question is, are infant consciousness, are, are infant conscious, or is it indeterminate whether infants are conscious? If you assume the indeterminate thesis, it seems that maybe it's indeterminate whether infants are conscious. So maybe infants are zombies. <laughs> or maybe infants are Illuminati. Uh, if, you cannot, if, you, if you cannot determine if infants are conscious, maybe you can never know if they are zombies or Illuminati. It's okay, so identity and infants. How can we uh, think about this, the, the problem, the distribution uh, question? So, for example, if consciousness is a physical property that is determinate, and infants have that uh, physical property, then we can claim that infants are conscious. But if it is indeterminate whether consciousness is a physical property N, then it may be indeterminate whether infants are conscious. So here, maybe this is a way uh, that Balog can reply to this, uh, this problem um, between the identity, the uh, indeterminacy of identity and the distribution uh, of consciousness in the case of infants. So Balog may reply, it's determinate that consciousness correlates with a physical property and what is indeterminate is whether this correlation is an identity, as in the case of materialism or physicalism, or a law in the case of dualism or NIP dualism. However, uh, once we have so much indeterminacy concerning consciousness, why should the indeterminacy be so restricted? So how can she, uh, uh, she considered just uh, indeterminacy so restricted in this. Maybe if you assume indeterminacy, maybe this would be uh, less restricted than she, she might have thought. Okay, so now I'll go through some ways that Cotty maybe can reply to, my, uh, to the cases of variety of, uh, the variety of the indeterminacy the cases I, I raised before. So one way she can reply is the uh, thing about indeterminacy and verbal disputes. So Balog can, can say that this indeterminacy arises from verbal disputes, involve two different concepts of uh, property or phenomenal property. But we can uh, also ask Kati if, if this verbal dispute, if it's just a verbal di dispute whether infants have phenomenal properties or not. Would it, could it be just a verbal dispute? It's just a case of a verbal dispute to decide if infants have phenomenal properties or not. In the distribution, uh, so maybe you can maybe disambiguate between distribution in possible cases and distribution in actual cases. So even if Balog says distribution of consciousness in actual cases determin determinate, so you can determinate if it's unconscious, distribution in possible cases can be indeterminate. So this is what she, she saying. So for example, a physical duplicate of us in a purely physical world can be indeterminate if this, uh, if this uh, physical duplicate is, is conscious. So on Balog's view, it's indeterminate whether such a being is conscious in the possible case. Uh, One way to uh, 
to confront Carter with this, uh, this idea that maybe, in the, maybe the, indeterminate, the indeterminate thesis apply just for the possible case is uh, to bring uh, to the discussion um, one idea defended by John Simon and Michael Anthony. So John Simon and Michael Anthony claim that phenomenon consciousness, consciousness is not vague and that whether someone is conscious, not conscious cannot be indeterminate. So what they said is asking whether someone is phenomenally conscious is like asking whether the light is on or the light is off. So there is no uh, vagueness in consciousness or no indeterminacy in consciousness. I would like to see how Cotty can uh, react to this uh, sort of objection that John and Simon and Michael Anthony can raise to this uh, indeterminate thesis. So, okay, so a final question is, if, if actual cases of consciousness are never indeterminate, can possible cases be indeterminate? But this is question. This is the, now the summary of what I of my comments. Next. <laughs> so on Belloc's view, many things are indeterminate. Model claims, metaphysical claims, identity claims, causal claims, distribution of consciousness, impossible, and perhaps actual cases. So it is plausible that all those things are indeterminate, Isn't this a big cost to pay for this, for <laughs> assuming this indeterminate thesis? And if it is a big cost to pay, maybe we are back to the beginning, to the metaphysical gridlock <laughs> that we started. Okay, thank you. <laughs> No, I just stay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks, Claudia. This was fantastically useful and interesting questions. And uh, so I will also focus on the indeterminacy issue in my responses. So, so basically, there's two parts, uh, there's two different um, two different attitudes I'm going to take to your kind of probing questions of, you know, do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? Do you? So I, I want to kind of split the difference between, um, you know, the, the cases where you, um, where you push me to say, you know, why, what prevents you from saying that, uh, that um, you know, statements about the distribution of consciousness are not indeterminate in the way that um, uh, that is very implausible. Uh, I want to put that to one side, and then then those cases that you mention, you know, isn't it the case that your proposal about the indeterminacy of the concept property pushes you to also uh, um, embrace indeterminacy about modal notions and about uh, causal, uh, you know, um, uh, causal notions and, um, and, and so on and so forth. So I want to sort of treat those cases differently. And about the letter that, uh, that I just mentioned, you know, isn't that, isn't that um, um, indeterminacy about the concept property, isn't that gonna infect many other concepts? And I totally agree with that. So that's something, that's a bullet I am I'm prepared to bite. <laughs> Here, so I, I do think that uh, that uh, that indeterminacy about the concept property will infect our notions of modality. You know what's necessary and what's possible, um, and in fact, our notion of um, 
of causation in a way that causal statements, you know, in these cases, you know, involving minds, you know, will come out different, you know, depending on which notion of property is at play. You know, similarly, as I said, with modality, you know, modal claims will come out different, you know, depending on which notion of modality, uh, property is at play. And so that, that, to some extent, infects those notions as well. So there will be a modality, you know, necessi necessity sub D, necessity sub P, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a consequence that's unavoidable for this view, in my opinion. But I, I don't feel horribly upset about that consequence, because that's just, uh, that's just the nature of these fundamental concepts that they provide, that they, um, that they uh, comprise, you know, a, a, a holistic framework for describing everything. And so, uh, so if there is a variation in one of the fundamental notions, you know, there will have to be variation in the others as well, you know, given their holistic connections and so on. So I would like to sort of bite the bullet on that part. <laughs> so, so the other suggestion that if, if I go full indeterminate on the concept of property, why don't I go indeterminate on the concept of consciousness? Is, is that, am I understanding you right? Uh, so in some concepts of consciousness, babies might be conscious, some other concepts of consciousness, babies might not be conscious. And you also challenged me to say something about purely possible situations, you know, whether they're um, the notion of consciousness would um, deliver indeterminate answers about possible creatures' consciousness status, right? Um, so, so f with regard to those questions, uh, I would like to say no. So I would like to, I agree with Anthony and Simon that, um, that an, a, a thesis about um, indeterminacy in our consciousness concepts is, is very implausible and, uh, and, uh, and I actually um, tackle that issue. So there is an issue for the physicalist that, and I think that Papineau actually full embraces that view. There's an issue for the physicalist to understand how, you know, if, if quite plausibly the neural correlates of, of consciousness are, um, uh, are, are not unique, you know, there might be um, biological and function, various level of functional properties that are coextensive with with uh, phenomenal properties, then uh, you know, then um, uh, multiple you know such properties coextensive with phenomenal properties that you know that seems to have the the the, the it, it seems to push us in the direction to suppose that there is no um, unique referent for, for, you know, in, in physical functional terms, for, for phenomenal, um, 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 let, let me just backtrack, not that there is no unique referent, but that, that phenomenal um, concepts are not um, correlated with unique physical or functional um, uh, concepts as, as their um, as as their coextensive as as the concepts that that um, um, are either as the concepts that denote something that's either identical or 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 realize the phenomenal properties. So that if there are multiple of those, then then there might not be a matter of fact which physical or functional concept denotes the, the phenomenal property and therefore there might be a, a, um, um, might not be a matter of fact whether as you say babies or animals or aliens or machines are conscious or not because they might share some of the realizers um, some of the the neural correlates of phenomenal properties but not others so so in that case 
there might be indeterminacy, but, but eventually I think I found a way in which the physical is using the phenomenal concept strategy can avoid that type of indeterminacy. So, so I'm not a fan of indeterminacy in the concept of consciousness at all, but, but I don't think that, that I am pushed in that direction, you know, uh, certainly not only by, you know, simply by virtue of advocating indeterminacy of, in the concept of property. So, so I think that that's a separate issue. The concept of property being indeterminate doesn't put any pressure on me to, to go indeterminate with regard to the concept consciousness. Um, so, so for example, let's suppose, um, uh, let's suppose that babies are conscious. You know, it's, it's a separate issue whether we can ever know such a thing. I mean, I believe firmly that babies are conscious, but, <laughs> but maybe we'll never really know for sure. But let's suppose babies are, are conscious. Now, you know, whether, whether we uh, think about baby consciousness in the physicalist framework, you know, based on P properties, or we think of them in a, a dualist framework based on, on D properties, the, the, the statement babies are conscious will come out true or false on, um, you know, um, will come out true in both or false in both. Uh, it's not gonna, you know, the, the, the variation in the uh, concept of property not gonna split the difference with regard to the existence of consciousness of babies or, or animals or machines or, and so on. So, so I, would, I would like to hear some, something more from you of what do you think that in my, uh, my view about property and determinacy really pushes me in the direction of indeterminacy with regard to concept, uh, consciousness. I, I guess I wasn't talking in the microphone. <laughs> so the last thing I want to um, pick up on is on, oh, you said something about the, uh, for example, a physical duplicate in a purely physical world, right? Uh, what about their consciousness? So, so, a, um, so, um, like a, 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 a complete physical duplicate of you in a purely physical world, will it be? Will, will there be a determinate answer about whether that creature is conscious or not? Is is that what you're asking? Is, you know, so let's take uh, a physical duplicate of yours in a purely physical world. Uh, I think that was one of your examples. And the question was, is there going to be a determinate fact about whether that creature is conscious, right? Yeah. Um, so, um, so let me say, see. So, so let's, take the, uh, let's take P properties, right? Um, P properties, on P properties, um, such a purely physical creature will be conscious, you know, if you are conscious, right? Um, in the case of D properties, so let's think in terms of D properties, um, such a, um, I see, so, so if you think in terms of D properties, we, you know, um, then there is no such <laughs> um, just one second. I, I think I got the answer. Just one second. Um, so such a world in um, um, when we think about the possible worlds in, in D, uh, P terms is, is just like our world and, and we are, and the, you know, you are conscious there. Um, now, a world that is purely physically um, ident that is, uh, you know, that has creatures that are physically identical with you and is purely physical is, is a world that's only, um, So 
So, so if you think about it in D terms, that's a zombie world. I, I, I'm actually, I take back, I'm not sure I, I can you know, uh, unspool this. Uh, so thanks for the question. I will have to think more about that. Um, I think that, the, that it's not going to result in uh, an indeterminacy in the same world. You know, I think that according to the D and P properties, we will, um, we will allow different possible worlds to exist. So, so if, if, you, um, if you are thinking about it in terms of D properties, there will be no consciousness there, and so that's a zombie world. But, but in, the, um, in the P property framework, there are no such zombie worlds. So I think that you can resolve this not, not by allowing indeterminacy in worlds um, about consciousness status, but rather resolve it in terms of what possible words are allowed, you know, depending on whether you use P or D properties. I think the answer is somewhere along li these lines. I'm not sure I was completely clear about this, but that's, I think that seems to me the, <laughs> the answer to that. So, so basically, thanks, thanks again, you know, really good questions. And as I said, I would like to accept some of your provocations and, and uh, and not accept some others. I don't think that my view pushes me into indeterminacy about, about consciousness. Thanks, that's a fascinating uh, interchange. And uh, yeah, the paper is, uh, is I mean, the view in the paper is absolutely uh, fascinating and intriguing. And I have to think it all the way through. I mean, it's a very radical suggestion that these things are indeterminate and that we have these two concepts of, two, ki two concepts of property and two kinds of property. And I guess I'm just trying to think my way through that uh, Suggestion. I mean, I like, in general, I like the strategy of finding distinctions and finding potential verbal disputes between two different concepts. And the idea that there are this, these two concepts of property seems a very, you know, potentially powerful one. I mean, I guess what I always like to do then is say, okay, well, we've got these two concepts. Let's give them better articulations. And we'll just, from now on, we'll use two different words property one and property two, or you said P property and D property. But I guess it'd be useful to maybe hear a bit more about just what that distinction is. I mean, you called them materialist property and dualist property. But um, I guess it strikes me that the distinction can't quite be as limited as that. I mean, yes, it's a distinction you've brought to bear on the materialist versus dualist debate. But if it just turned out that this distinction between two kinds of properties arose from some issue about materialism and dualism. That would be, seem very surprising and maybe a bit ad hoc. So I guess it would be nice if it turns out to be a distinction one can characterize in much more general metaphysical or metaphysical and epistemological terms. I mean, there's a few distinctions a bit like that out there already. You know, was it Lewis had sparse properties and abundant properties? People have natural properties and unnatural properties. So, so I guess. First thing I'm curious about is what kind of maybe more independent characterization one could give. I mean, one thing you said is, um, well, one of them obeys the CP thesis and the other one doesn't. Maybe that would be a bit more general. But even that distinction, I would think, would probably have to have somewhat broader roots. I mean, maybe the idea is one kind of property is somehow concept dependent, concept tied property, and the other one is concept independent property. I don't know if we have Frigean properties and Russellian properties or... I mean, one way it could end up going is you have mind-dependent properties and mind-independent properties. I worry a little bit about it going that way because then, once we go that way, then uh, every physicalist out there apart from you is going to say, ah, oh, the, one, the, the one that we cared about all along was the mind-dependent thing. And yeah, it was, was the mind-independent thing. Yeah, sure, I was always happy to be a conceptual dualist. Even Papineau will, will admit that. But, um, but uh, he said, well, what I cared about was dualism in the mind-independent world. 
So if it turns out that the dualist properties are merely mind-dependent things, then that wouldn't be such a great reconciliation for me. So I guess yeah, the, so the first thing I'm curious about is just what kind of independent characterization one can give. I'm also interested in whether the fundamental distinction to be made here is, I mean, as you said, the, the ambiguity here or the indeterminacy ramifies to many things, modality, causation, um, and you know, metaphysics, as Claudia brought out. So one, uh, so I guess you're gonna end up with a few other subscripted notions too, like possible one, possible two, cause one, cause one, cause two, and I guess I'm interested in whether, A, how far that's gonna ramify, how far your subscripts are gonna go. I mean, I think Claudia was suggesting you'd end up needing consciousness one and consciousness two, but if not that far, I'm curious about exactly how far the subscripts will ramify, and whether it's the case that all of those distinctions are fundamentally grounded in, there's one basic distinction, property one versus property two. Then it just turns out all those other notions are basically dependent on the notion of property, so you get one versus two distinctions for each of those because of the property distinction or whether you actually have to end up independently introducing notions like possible one, possible two. I mean, the kind of case you were discussing near the end made me worry that merely having property one and property two and just combining that with ordinary possible necessary wasn't necessarily, wasn't quite going to do it because you have zombie worlds. Well, the zombie world has the property one of consciousness, but it doesn't have the property two of consciousness. And well, then that's going to lead you to the situation that Claudia worried about. It was indeterminate or ambiguous whether there was even consciousness in that world. So maybe then you have to say it's possible one, but it's not possible two. Anyway, so that's probably, probably enough to be going on with. <laughs> Love to hear what you think. Yeah, uh, well, thanks, thanks so much. Um, so, I, there was one thing I, I'm not sure I understood, you know, completely followed what you were saying, that, that, that it might, that this view might make dualism in general trivial, um, which I didn't mean to do. I mean, cl clearly, interactive property dualism is a distinct position from both of these, and and I think that's an interesting position. I feel like, like that's where the real debate is about this materialism. Um, and uh, and so, so I didn't mean to, I, I don't know if this is an answer to what you were saying, but I didn't mean to have a view on which there is really no um, dualist position that would be in any way interesting and interestingly different. So, so the other thing is that, um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really interesting question to follow out, you know, how far the indeterminacy spreads and, and what's the source, you know, do I have to answer what's the primary source of that is and whether it's plausibly really the property trans transparency issue here that, that is spreading everywhere. I don't know, but in terms of the, whether it spreads to consciousness, I, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't get a sense that it would, that you know, I, I didn't see the the the, the push, the, the the pressure of how it would spread that far. And as I said, I wouldn't like it to spread that far. But it's kind of pretty immediate and straightforward that it has to spread to modal notions, to to causal notions, and and um, nomological notions as well. You know, the law of nature versus metaphysical necessity, they're, they're also gonna be um, variants on concepts of law um, that, that, that accommodate that, you know, apparent conflict between, between uh, the psychophysical relations being nomological versus metaphysical. So, so those I see pretty clearly, I don't see yet if, you know, how, how these would spread to consciousness Notions, you know, if it does, then I won't be that happy with the view, I think. But um, we'll see. So I guess, um, yeah, if it turns out, for example, that the property one, you've got used locutions like the property one of consciousness and the property two of consciousness, the two different things they refer to. If it turns out there's any possible scenario where those things, then you, and I was thinking, okay, consciousness one is the property one of consciousness, consciousness two, is the property two of consciousness. Now maybe you'd say those two things necessarily go together, but if we find one situation where there's the 
property one of consciousness, but not the property two of consciousness, then suddenly... Yeah, that would be bad. It looks like we start... Yeah, but do, do you see one off the top of your head? I was thinking that once we got to things like the, uh, the zombie world for D properties, like if you allow that it's possible there's a... Well, it's possible to have all the D properties of the physical world, all the D physical properties, or the physical D properties would be the word, but not the consciousness D property, then, okay, if that's possible, we've got a world without consciousness D, whichever one, I can't remember which one was one and which one was two, was two, <laughs> without consciousness D, but I thought you might say, but it does have, it's, but that world's physically identical, so it will have consciousness P, and then we're going to have to start finding at least possible situations where they come apart. Yeah, so that's what I was struggling with. I was trying to resolve by saying that, that the very existence of that zombie world is on, on, on D conception, but that would not be a possible world on, on P conception to begin with. So, so I don't think that we could drive the... You know, so now you way. need a separate subscripting for possible and necessary, which isn't just derivative on it's possible to have blah, blah, blah with all the D properties. Rather, I specified, all, I specified what was the situation using your notions of the D properties are like this, but the P properties are like that. Now you think there's a separate disambiguation we have to make for possible and necessary that's so, independent so of the word. Possible D know, and possible P. I, I would love it if you just, if we could just sit down and write it, because I'm not sure I'm following the whole thing. <laughs> Hi, um, thanks, that was really interesting. I was wondering if you could go back to the slide um, we talked about why, oh, sorry. Um, is that better? Uh, sure, sorry. Okay, um, I was wondering if we could see the slide where you said holism, ho holistic considerations couldn't resolve the dispute. Sorry. Sorry. Um, it's closer to the end than the beginning. But, um, sorry. Yeah. It's before that. Yeah, we must have gone for before that. It's before that. I think we've passed it. Yes, you said, um, so you said there's underdetermination of theory by evidence, so, and then you said, uh, this is something that happens a lot in philosophy and in science, so the empirical evidence underdetermines which theory is correct. Um, uh, and I was thinking, so one way that this typically gets resolved in both philosophy and in science is to look at overall is to look at overall coherence and uh, simplicity and so forth. Uh, there it is. No. Okay. Oh, maybe not on the slide. I'm sorry. I was uh, sorry. I was wondering if you could maybe expand on why the overall considerations of simplicity. So, so you point out that there's this dispute about whether the conceivability principle is true, uh, and then you point out maybe empirical evidence underdetermines whether it's true, and then it maybe, in, uh, maybe in discussion, or in, in you said, ah, ah, you said they're equally good as generally good. I was wondering maybe if you could, so yeah, so physicalism, so now, so now we say, well, quite often in science and in philosophy, when we have underdetermination of 
theory by evidence. We look at holistic considerations, like which theory is simpler, which, which, which one is the most useful, and so forth. Um, and I was just wondering why, in general, um, you think physicalism and NIP dualism are equally good. I mean, physicalism does seem simpler in lots of ways. It seems uh, so. So why can't holistic considerations resolve the d dispute here, as they seemingly can in all sorts of me other metaphysical and scientific disputes, like between Ptolemaism and Copernicanism? Um, uh, so. <coughs> Yeah, so so I don't I don't have anything like um, novel or original to say about that. Just just the usual grounds that that people usually that people um, cover in these debates. So so there is a, the causal argument for physicalism that shows that um, that um, um, unless you're an interactionist dualist, which is you know yet to be you know have any evidence for, you'll be pushed in a position to either be an epiphenomenalist and um, um, and Victor was uh, mounting a defense of of epiphenomenalism, which was interesting, but but still most people consider that not very appealing, and and especially the. Causal over determination is a is a fairly crazy view that I don't think anybody openly advocated <laughs> uh, so far, and so the causal argument pushes non-interactive dualists in in this you know unappealing to take this unappealing choice. On the other hand, dualism um, uh, dualists point to the uh, to the idea that they have a, a much more appealing. Account and simple account of modality um, based on con you know the the connection between conceivability and um, and, uh, and and of course the explanatory gap that most people you know even physicalists are a little bothered by that there would be an explanatory gap and um, I, I don't know if I left out I'm probably left out many more uh, you know things that can be said in favor of uh, of one or the other so simplicity favors physicalism or or parsimony at least favors physicalism the idea that that um um dualists have to posit fundamental laws that connect very complex physical state with with uh, with simple fundamental uh, phenomenal states that also is, uh, you know, sometimes pointed out it's not a particularly beautiful metaphysical p picture that there, and you know, as I said, I probably left some out, but, um, yeah. Actually, I, I want to just say something briefly uh, about, uh, I see a lot of, uh, things in common between the way you uh, define, sorry? Oh, okay. Is it fine now? Okay. Uh, I see a lot uh, in common uh, between the way you approach a lot of issues here and the way I do. And I remember my talk, uh, I argue for this, uh, there is no uh, principal way to get this uh, uh, conceivability, possibility, connection, as uh, David tries to, to to do, and you 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 argue that uh, there is this question is somehow underdetermined in in a way, and that's what I'm interested in here. Uh, you said that, and it has to do with Brian's question, uh, because what makes this uh, uh, particularly uh, underdetermined? is the fact that it's not a discussion about a theoretical problem uh, in a science that has its foundations already established, right? So it's a, some sort of a uh, dispute over the fundamental uh, basis of the whole thing. So whatever you do there, it seems to, to, to be not principled in any way. So uh, there is no way to settle the matter. Uh, and I said that, I mean, in my talk that I mean, it seems to be a typical case of uh, let's get the data, uh, what is to be explained here, let's tell a story, and I mean, it's going to be a long inference to the best explanation. So, 
Now, what makes this case different of typical, uh, uh, you know, theory construction in, in which you have to start from the beginning and just kind of see if your story uh, is going to, you know, uh, show a nice picture at the end? I mean, it seems to be the case, right? What makes it peculiarly, uh, like, underdetermined? The, the, last point, the last point you made, I, I didn't quite catch. That it, it's just like, suppose, so it's just this kind of dispute over fundamental concepts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but doesn't mean it can't be settled. It's just, yeah, let's start a story and let's, you know, go through this long inference to the best explanation. And maybe eventually we're going to get this fundamental theory and agree upon it, right? But it, it, it's not, there is nothing specifically, uh, specifically underdetermined about this problem, right? It's just like any other uh, uh, yeah, it's science right, or anything. Yeah, it's in, in some sense, it's like any other. But as you said, in, in science, there are ways in which uh, theories are, uh, are evaluated based on long you know, uh, tradition of scientific practice, right? But there is no similar, you know, because whatever worked you know, in, in, in science and I guess at least part, partly the, the scientific criteria for um, inference to best explanation, you know, are you know are honed in a long tradition of sci actual scientific practice, and that doesn't. I mean, there's not a similar tradition of metaphysical practice that kind of whittled methods, <laughs> you know, that are you know that are preferable and methods that are dispreferable. I, I think in that way it's maybe different uh, and i and i'm not saying that that there is that i you know that i'm certain that there is no uh, good argument for you know good inference to the best explanation type argument there it's just that it doesn't strike me having thought about it for a while now it just doesn't strike me that the you know that that it exists at the moment <laughs> Okay, maybe this is a minor point, but you adopt um, uh, a particular version of the phenomenal concept, <coughs> the quotational version, according to which a token of the phenomenal, a token of the experience is part of the, the token of the phenomenal concept. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, and you also mentioned that there are no empirical evidences that concept, phenomenal concepts are like that but there are also no principled reason why this empirical evidence couldn't be found. Mm -hmm. But my question is, uh, what if the evidence go the other way around? What if uh, empirical evidence makes very, okay, plausible that there are no such, uh, okay, such quotational pheno phenomenal concepts. Would that lead to a big chance in your big picture? Or could you adopt another version of phenomenal concept instead? Is, does, is, that, that, is that so important for your, for your theory that phenomenal concepts should be conceived as quotational concepts? Yeah, so I, I guess uh, the, the phenomenal concept strategy has been run on, on other versions of, um, of this uh, strategy. You know, that this is what to, seems to me the constitutional account that seems to me the most plausible. You know, the constitutional account most plausible. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course there would be a problem if it turns out that um, that uh, Phenomenal concepts work, you know, in substantively different ways than this theory says. But, but I'm sort of, I don't expect that to 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 happen because because the, there's I think fairly good introspective, you know, access to phenomenal concepts themselves, and and I think that the idea that phenomenal states themselves will play some such role in phenomenal concepts is is fairly well established in, in um, you know, in, in our awareness of our thought and, and so on. So um, there, there might be some details that are, 
you know, maybe problematic for the account, but there is some, some involvement of phenomenal states in phenomenal concepts. I think it's fairly well, uh, to me, it seems, you know, um, fairly well grounded in, in, in awareness of experience.